All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for tonight, God. I thank you we get to break open your word. I thank you, Lord, that you lead us. I thank you that you guide us, Lord God, through your verses, Father, and you guide us with your Holy Spirit. So tonight, we pray for your presence. We pray for your guidance. We pray, Lord, that you speak to each person individually, God, as you speak through the songs, through the stories, Lord God, and through the word. And everybody said, amen. amen. Okay, so let me just explain a little bit about tonight, just to kind of lay a foundation for the atmosphere. This atmosphere, we're going to, we want freedom in here. Okay, so we can even lower the lights a little bit even now. And we want you to feel like there, there is a freedom. There, there's a small amount of structure, but we, we want you to feel like during these stories and the testimonies that are going to be told, during the worship songs, that you can either stand and sing, you can sit in your seat, you can open up your word if the Lord directs you to a verse, you could even journal if you want to. We want you to be able to move in that freedom because we think that in that atmosphere, God is going to speak to you. And we've been praying for it. I know me and Pastor Jess, we love this type of style. This is fun. You know, as a kid, when I was in youth ministry, I got saved and I started having these things called bonfire worship nights at my house. And it was a time where maybe it was about 30 students in youth ministry would come over and we would just sing around a campfire. And it really was probably like a move of God because who can find 30 teenagers who want to hang out on the weekend and just praise God? And so in those moments, I really believe it prepared me for ministry. It prepared me for purpose. And even, you know, people here on the front row, like we were, we were there. It, it, it's just amazing. And even people who are now, I, I know my friend who would come to those bonfires. He did an art festival in Redlands, and he's still in ministry. I believe in this atmosphere, God's going to speak to you. He's going to speak to you about your purpose. He's going to speak to you about your next steps. He's going to speak faith into your heart. And through the worship and through the prayer warfare that you're going to do in your own seat, God's going to move. Amen? Woo, I'm excited. Okay, turn to Revelations 12, chapter 12, verse number 11. Some of you said, ooh, her first verse is in Revelation. Well, as my friend Jaden says, <laughs> Revelations 12, 11. Let's talk about our stories, our testimonies. See, tonight I want you to remember the first thing is this, is that our stories have power. Your unique individual story has so much power. In a Revelations 12, 11, it says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. See, your testimony is simply your story. What has God done in your life? What has God done for you? What were you like before God? How did you meet God? And what are you like now? See, that's your story. And it's all, if you look around this room, it's all ages and different walks of life. And your story has so much power because when you share that testimony, when you share that story, it empowers somebody else to say, you know what, if God did it for them, then God can do it for me. It carries power. It carries so much power. And it takes courage to share a story. It takes courage to step out in faith and say, well, you know, I don't want people to look at me different. I don't want people to see me different. They don't know what my past was like. They don't know what I've been through. So let me just, let me just stay the, the Christian that they see me as. Can, can we talk about this thing called being flawless and how it's such a joke? You know, they're, they're, this word, this is like a trendy word now, flawless. You know, I woke up like this, right? Like that, that is a thing now. And if Christians would just realize if we would stop trying to be flawless and give God the glory of the flaws that he's rescued us, we would see more people in the kingdom. People need to hear about our flaws. You know, even as I'm up here speaking to you right now, speaking of flaws, I have a black eye. Like literally, a black eye. Like this is not a spiritual example. <laughs> this is like a real physical thing that happened to me. So, and you guys may be looking at Rich and you say, well, after 14 years of marriage, I don't, you know, I, I get it. Okay, but... <laughs> wasn't Richard. It was, uh, it was actually my three-year-old. And um, I was doing this exercise, the little push-up thing, and she was running underneath me being all cute. Didn't see her. My eye hit the top of her head. And I had a knot that I swear is about two inches out over my eye. And then it went down and then it turned purple. So I'm wearing so much makeup right now that literally if I blink, it may crumble off my face. So it's just packed on and packed on. But, um, but if I don't share 
my flaws and show you how, you know, there, there's things that we all struggle in. And I mentioned it to Pastor Jess, you know, I have a black eye. And she said, oh, my gosh, I remember when mom got a black eye from, you know, right, in, right before girls night out. And then I shared it with Pastor Deborah. And, and I said, yeah, I have a black eye. She's like, oh, I remember when a ladder hit my eye and I got a black eye. And it was just something about hearing that someone else went through what I went through that it just made me feel a little bit better. You see, the world needs that. Media is so fake. This whole thing that I woke up like this and this flawless attitude, it's so fake that the world wants vulnerability. The world wants to be, see something that's genuine and we can offer that through our stories because they have power. Through your testimony. See, we can say that God is great and we all believe that God is great, but when we talk to a world that doesn't even believe in God, they don't get it. They don't even understand that God is great. But if I can tell them why he's great, because he saved my marriage, because he saved my children, because I was sick and now I'm healed. Well, now it's changed everything. The world can see it. Your stories have power. The second thing I want you to know and, and remember about tonight is that worship is your weapon. Worship is your weapon. See, in, in Acts chapter 16, verse number 25, you can read it on your own, but you had Paul and Silas stuck in prison, bound up, and what did they begin to do? They began to praise him. And the prison doors unlocked, and they were set free. See, worship can be your weapon tonight. What is locked up in your world that needs to be set free? What is hanging over your head and heavy on your heart that you need to let go of? You need to praise him. What are you believing for? Praise him and watch worship be your weapon. And number three, the last thing, is that use this time. Use this time. God ordained tonight. You are here not by mistake, but God has a purpose to speak to you tonight. You know, two years ago, God spoke to me about the youth ministry. And, and I, you know, we always tell the kids, read your Bible read your Bible, read your Bible. And I began to think about it. I'm like, I don't know if they're really reading their Bible. And so as a youth ministry, we carved out time for the youth to read their Bible. And it's been two years and every Sunday night, they read a devotional by themselves. They read scripture by themselves. They answer questions about it. And then they talk about it as a group. And it's so healthy for them and it's so good to grow. That was an atmosphere we wanted to provide for the youth. So tonight we want to provide an atmosphere for you to carve out time. For you to talk to the Lord. For you to pray for things. Listen, life is so busy. And we know we need to have our quiet time with God. We know we need to put on the worship music. We know we need to open the word. But sometimes it just doesn't happen. Tonight, let's experience it together. Because when we walk through it together, it is very easy to take that thing home and do it ourselves because we've already done it together. So don't waste tonight. Don't zone out tonight. But tonight, take this moment to be with God and just to worship him and do the warfare prayer and whatever he's putting on your heart. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Worship team, why don't you go ahead and move up, move up forward. We're going to share three stories with you tonight. Three testimonies tonight. And the first one, is, I, I just, I just want to share with you, it's about loss. It's about lack. And in Psalms 3410, if we can have that, have that up on the overhead, it talks about those who trust in the Lord, there will be no lack of any kind. See, when you trust in God, when you trust in him, there is, there may be lack that comes at you, but when you trust in him, you know he will be your provider. You know, I remember a time in my life when when maybe, maybe it wasn't lacking money and maybe it wasn't lacking stuff, but I definitely felt a lack of joy in my heart. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you felt a, a lack of faith or maybe, maybe just a lack of, of just even wanting to continue on. But for me, it was a lack of joy. And that was painful nights. That was nights where I was in my word and I was trying to trust God and trusting him and trusting him. And I was just praying the word over myself. And soon... That left me. Soon the Lord provided. You see, lack and loss can't stay for too long because you are his beloved, because you trust in the Lord. And see, we may lack stuff or maybe, like I said, lack joy, but my friend here, she lacked a person in her life. So painful when you lose someone in your life. Maybe it's a relationship. 
Maybe it's a friendship. For this individual, it was parents. They just weren't there very much. And this friend of mine, her name is Vanessa, but we like to call her V. And we always do this because she's V. And I love her so much. I've known her for over 15 years. 15 years. And, and she's an amazing person. And her parents, they were not there all the time to raise her. But you know what she did as a child? She took care of her brother and sister. She walked them to church herself. And that lack that she could have felt, she found that fulfillment in the Lord. So let's go ahead and listen to her story. I um, grew up in church. Um, my parents were involved in ministry. Um, my dad had his own business. You know, they were involved in ministry. My dad was in the choir. My mom was a dancer. I always found out that my dad, he had an affair with my mom and she ended up divorcing him. So when I was 12 years old, she told my dad that she was gonna go wash and she put all her clothes into the car and we and she my mom left my dad. Things, you know, got really bad. My mom, she wanted to be young again. She was going out all the time. They were, she, my mom was leaving us with, you know, whoever she was going out with that night and I would end up having to babysit those kids. Um, and my dad, he was on drugs and in and out of jail this whole time. Going up in church, even though I knew God and I knew who he was, I had a really firm foundation of who God was in your life, but I didn't know that you could have a relationship with him, that he could talk to you and you could, you know, know him, an intimate relationship with him. And um, when I was 16, I went to a concert and it was a punk rock concert and I got saved and they talked about having a relationship with God and knowing who he was and him talking to you and having a purpose for your life and a plan. Then there was a Christian band called All Together Separate that, you know, we kind of followed around and I loved and they were playing at The Rock. And that was the first time I ever came to The Rock. And my sister had a friend who attended the church and so he invited us to youth service. It, youth service. We came and we loved it. So we started going to The Rock all through my life, you know, all the times that we didn't have, you know, parents that were always there or we were always taken care of and I never felt that I wasn't loved. I always knew because God loves me and I never felt, um, you know, from when I was younger, you know, you do feel abandoned, but as I got older and, and I, you know, knew who Jesus was and had a relationship with him I, and I knew that he had a purpose for my life. Those things were hard at times, but God always provided and I never felt unloved. I never felt, even though my parents maybe weren't there at the time, um, I always knew God loved me and that helped me. And there's a lot of things I could have been. There's a lot of places that I could be, but because of God's faithfulness, I am, you know, I'm here, I'm, I'm who I am, <laughs> but I'm not searching for something that someone can give me because God has already given me those things that I need. Love. Thank you, Lord, that when the world can let us down and people can defeat us, Lord, you are never lacking in anything. And Lord, we press in tonight. And Lord, we want to be at your feet and we want to be close to you. In 2 Thessalonians 3 5, it says, May the Lord lead your hearts into a full understanding and an expression of the love of God and the patient endurance that comes from Christ. Sometimes in life, things don't go the way we plan them. I'm one of those planners. I don't know about you, but I am like, if you know me, I have a plan and don't mess up the plan because I'm comfortable in my plan. And I've been feeling and hearing the Spirit of God say, oh, but, but daughter, your plan is about to get mixed up. It's about to get changed. It's about to get renewed. It's about to get, you know, exchanged for something that I need and I have for you. And you say, well, the plan in life for me was never a good one. Or maybe you were lacking in some things when you were born into this world. Maybe your parents had let you down and maybe you weren't comfortable in knowing who you were and you weren't confident in your own feet and your own clothes and your own body. And there's always something going on. You're having an identity crisis and you don't know who you are because your identity with people in the world is, is twisted and they've let you down and they don't, it's not a clear and beautiful picture of what it should be. But you see, we serve a God in heaven who is perfect in all ways. We serve a God in heaven who formed you and loved you. 
We turned to God in heaven that said, oh, I just got to get them there. It didn't matter how you got here. It meant that when you get here, that he has a plan and he has a purpose and he has a destiny for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 is my favorite scripture in the whole entire world because when I was having a hard time, when I was having an identity crisis as a young girl and when things weren't going my way and when I didn't understand and when the world around me would fall apart, you know what? I would remind myself, oh yeah. God says, for I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper, plans to give you a future, plans to give you a hope. Tonight I wanna, wanna encourage you, the altars are open during every worship song. And you can just stay and hang out during the videos. You can come sit teenagers on the floor if that's what you wanna do. This is the living room of God tonight. And when we hear these testimonies, and we raised her sisters and her family. What a beautiful testimony for V because now her sister's up here singing. V is like our number one like person in our office. She makes everything happen behind the scenes around here. She's so special. But we wanted to tell you another story of an incredible man that I got to be part of his family because I was his sister's best friend. And he was a gangbanger in his life, and, and he, was, um, he was one of those taggers, you know, and he would always show me when I was a kid, look at my cool tagging things, and I'm thinking, oh gosh, like you're gonna get arrested, you know? And I just remember every day he would hang out with me and my friend, which she was my best friend, and he always was just such a loving guy. He was always just so outgoing. And you may know him because God turned his life around, changed him and renewed him from the inside out. And now he's our children's pastor, Pastor Mondo Flores. I love him. He's a man of God. God has saved him and redeemed him. But let's listen to his testimony. Remember, the altars are open. You know, my dad, my dad was, uh, my dad was always working. And he would take me places. He would um, take me to the shop, you know. And you know, he's he's over here working under the hood and dealing with all kinds of different things. And um, I'd be in the back somewhere, like in the tires, you know, messing with equipment. But then I don't know what happened in in life to where we stopped doing that. You know, we we stopped being close. Soon after that, I got plugged into baseball, stayed active. You know, and then all of a sudden my dad starts showing up and starts, you know, playing a part of that. I saw my dad in a completely different way. It got to the point where I didn't just want that on the field, like I wanted that everywhere. You know, my dad, my dad was a heavy drinker and so on the off times when, you know, we're not at practice, he was usually in his garage, you know, drinking and listening to music and I got courageous and I just told him, I was like, look, I want what you give me all the time. Like I want, I just want you to say I love you. You know, and my dad looked at me and with this crazy expression, you know, he told me, I will never tell you that. You know, and so I remember I grabbed my baseball bag and, and I just threw clothes in it, you know, and I left. I got involved with drugs, you know, I got involved with alcohol, started running with a crowd that was a little bit of gangs, a little bit of street. I found out that my girlfriend is pregnant, you know, and, and man, that was like, what the heck am I gonna do? Like, and so finally, you know, the day comes where my daughter is born. Like, life changed. Like, I saw this little thing who, who needed me and who, who was dependent on me. And I remember she didn't open her eyes, but I just felt her so delicate. You know, I gotta get right, like, you know, and I started coming to, to the rock and, you know, and I remember sitting in the altar call. Man, I just, I felt it and I heard it in a whole different way. Accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I did the do, I walked through the altar, I went to the altar care room. I told myself, this is what I want as I got older. So I'm doing that today. I, I love my family. Um, you know, I'm a pastor at a church and this church and this, it's awesome. Like I get a chance to speak into the lives of kids. I tell my daughter all the time, man, you're the reason. You know, you're the reason why I am who I am. You were what I needed from God to situate life. I have heard my dad say, I love you. I have heard him, even in his weird, uncomfortable way, exp you know, show me that he loves me. And I'm, I'm such a believer that, you know, that God will restore all things, you know, and he'll, he'll bring back all things that you need within you that will complete you. You know, I'm growing, I'm developing, and I'm, I'm shaping into the man that I know God wants me to be. 
I just so um, appreciate uh, Pastor Michelle's exhortation a moment ago about being vulnerable and, and being open because um, we need to hear the victories that God has performed in one another's life in order to gain the strength to, to go through our own. And, uh, you know, the, the reality is, is that trouble comes to us all. And it comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Jesus says, you know, in this world you will have tribulation. It's kind of like, man, that's the one promise I don't want from God. But they come, not because, you know, they come from God, but we live in a fallen world and, you know, we have an enemy out there. And, and sometimes the, the ones that can uh, hurt the most are the ones that blindside you, the ones that you, you're not expecting, the ones that you never saw coming. And you just kind of like, wow, what, you know, what, what just happened? And so I've, I've learned that, you know, trouble comes to us all. But I've also found this to be true over, over the co course of my life is that in the darkest times is when the light of Jesus Christ shines the brightest. And when you feel mo most hopeless and when you feel like, man, I I've come to the end or this is, this is going to crash and burn, like this is over, that's when I have found uh, more so than at any other time God's everlasting arms holding me and embracing me and letting me know that he was there. And indeed, the word of God is true when it says he is a very present help in time of need. I wanted to read this verse before my wife shares a testimony. And uh, it's a testimony of when we were kind of blindsided, but of God's faithfulness. And this is what Nahum chapter 1 verse number 7 says. It says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. And so I just want to encourage you today that in your trouble, don't be afraid. He is a stronghold in that day, and he sees you as you trust in him. Here we are on finally the day that we go into labor, and we're on our way to the hospital to have um, our son, and we get there, and here comes out our beautiful son. You know, they brought him over to me, and they put him on my chest for probably a minute, and they, they started realizing that his color was a little off. But we found out that he had congenital heart disease. They finally tell us when I'm up and ready to walk that we can go over and we can actually see him. This would be our first official time of actually looking at our son. And, you know, they had him hooked up to a bunch of IVs and tubes and a life support machine on a breathing tube. And it just made it all real. You know, you don't, you don't think anything's going to be wrong when you have a kid. And here we are staring at our two-day-old baby um, on life support and just lifeless, laying there so drugged up from the drugs for his heart that he just, he didn't even move. When I think back now, and I look back now to those days, I see how serious it was. But in the moment, God just really held my heart and protected my heart. And then that night I went to bed and I thought, why us, God? Like, why do we have to be the ones with the kid. All the other kids around us were perfectly fine, but why did we have a child and why did we have to go through this? And he went through his first open heart surgery. It all went great. And then he was about seven weeks old. He had a second open heart surgery. Um, and then about a week later, they sent him home. So yay, here's our son getting to come home. Every day I had to, to feed him through a feeding tube and I did have to give him medicines every few hours. Um, I did have to check his oxygen once or twice a day. And then about two months later, he was only home for two months, um, his oxygen level had dropped to, he was a little over 50%. I rushed him back to the emergency room and he got admitted. So they told him that he would have to have his third, um, what they want to call the fixed surgery. He'd have to have his third open heart surgery. So here we find ourselves again at the hospital. We just really had to engage in some prayer and just believing in God. And the only word I can say for it is just supernatural faith. I mean, there's having a faith for him to come through, but this was just a faith I can't even explain. It was just so unreal, you know, it's just, here I am, I, I never had a thought in my mind that I was gonna lose my son. I never had a thought in my mind that he was gonna be gone. I never even thought he was on life support. And I'll never forget one of the nurses gave us a packet and it told us all of the 
cons and what could happen and all of the side effects to this disease. And as soon, you know, my husband's respectful, but as soon as we walked out the doors, he tossed it right into the trash and he said, that's not gonna happen to my son. My God is bigger and better than that. Here we are today, five years later, my son's about to start playing soccer, running around like a normal five-year-old, keeping up with every kid. Um, just a true blessing and a true joy, and he's just got more energy than any kid I think I've ever seen. I just stood on the verse that, um, for I knew you in your mother's womb, that he knew my son before he even took a day. Um, I just stood on that. Every day I would read that. How good is God that he holds his life in his hand, that we didn't have to have a fear, that we just had a, it was just a supernatural faith and just standing in faith for our son when he couldn't do it for himself. He is truly a miracle child. You say, well, I think I'd go to heaven. Maybe I'd go to heaven. Pastor Michelle, I, I don't know where I'd end up. Then tonight, why don't you leave knowing that you know that you're going to heaven? See, a lot of people think they're going to heaven because they're a good person. The sad thing is, is that nowhere in the Bible does it say that good people automatically go to heaven. Answer that to yourself. Are you going to heaven? You say, well, I believe in Jesus Christ. Good, I'm glad that you believe in Jesus, but what do you do about the verses that, this, that say the devil and the demons in hell believe in Jesus? They know who he is. Stop trying to figure everything out for yourself and realize that God sent his son to die on the cross for you because he loves you, because he wants to spend eternity with you, because he desires a relationship with you, but you've got to make the choice. You have not surrendered everything to him. If you know that you're not going to heaven, if you know that you've been playing games, then get your hand up. Raise your hand with boldness. Surrender your life to him. I'm telling you, it's one of the best decisions you could ever make.